David Harvey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start with the most profound, most important question of all. Very briefly, what is capitalism? Capitalism is a social system uh, which att uh, attempts to meet people's needs uh, through a system of uh, production and circulation of capital, which is profit-seeking, uh, which is constantly expanding, and which is uh, always uh, involved in class relations and the reproduction of class relations. And what's the difference between a capitalist mode of production and a socialist one? In a socialist one, uh, you would have uh, use values and the idea of use values dominating. Uh, in, in a purely socialist system, the exchange value aspects would disappear, whereas the theory in under capitalism is that everything has to be pushed through the market, uh, and because the market is the most efficient uh, way in which uh, you can provide people with their shirts and shoes and education and healthcare and everything else. Of course, it turns out that the market actually favours certain people and thus disfavours other people. So actually the market system is a great uh, way in which the rich can get richer and the poor can get poorer. So socialism produces things for use values. Yes. Capitalism produces things for exchange values. What's the, what's the difference between use and exchange value? Uh, with a use value, I have a shirt, I, I want to wear it, I have shoes I want to wear, I eat porridge for breakfast, I have a house I live in. These are all different use values which contribute to my daily life and my daily life rests on having a good supply of those use values and have me having access to those use values. Uh, that access, however, is controlled in a market society by how much money I have. So if I want to have a house, uh, very nice to have a house, but uh, in this contemporary market, you need a hell of a lot of money to get a house. So your access to housing is limited by the fact that you don't have enough money to get the housing. So you get homeless people or people currently you know, living doubled up in small cramped quarters because uh, the exchange value that is demanded of them is such that their own incomes are not sufficient uh, to cover it. And so some people will be hungry, some people won't have enough money to buy food, so uh, there's a rationing which goes on through the exchange value system. And the thing that really uh, irritates me a lot about capitalism is how much has to go through this exchange value system. So education has become a commodity, which you have to buy. Healthcare has become a commodity. These should be human rights, not commodities, which are rationed through uh, uh, the market system. So that word commodity, yeah. uh, for most people, I mean, everybody uses that word commodity. Yeah. We hear it every day of the week, but for a, for somebody with a Marxist understanding of, of the world, of capitalism, what does it specifically mean? It means, it means a, 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 the, the, the thing, the, the, the physical thing, uh, which is the shirt or the shoe or the porridge or the whatever or the house. It means a physical thing. But the physical thing contains something which is common to all things. And Marx asks the question, what is it that they all uh, have in common? And the answer he gives is that they're all products of human labor. So the thing that makes them equivalent is the amount of human labor that goes into making a shirt versus shoes versus houses. And the more human labor that uh, goes into a, a commodity, uh, the more valuable it is, the more value it has. And that value is generally expressed in monetary terms. But Marx makes clear that the value is a social relation and, and therefore has in itself no direct measure. So the measure of value is the money, and the money can often betray uh, the value for various kinds of reasons. So the Mar a Marxist would have a rather critical view of how exchange value can betray value at the same time as it restricts uh, people's access to use values because they don't have enough money to buy uh, whatever it is they might need uh, to have a decent daily life. Mm -hmm. So we're talking uh, today in specific regard to this book, your new book, yeah. Marx, Capital and the Madness of Economic Reason. Um, we interviewed you the last time uh, you did the book on contradicts. Was it the 17 contradictions, 17 contradictions, contradictions yeah. to capital? Right. Uh, excellent book. Most people who are aware of your work have come to you through your uh, lectures on capital, your sort of guides right. to them published right. with Verso, this is with Profile. Um, you have made a, a name for yourself on uh, being the go-to voice increasingly in the Anglophone world on Marx, 
you come from a geography background, but now you're, I think, the preeminent voice, it's fair to say, on the, the writings of Marx. After 30, 40 years of teaching Marx, of reading Marx, do you not get bored of it? Or is there always something new that you're learning? Is the, is the thinking that deep and that important? Well, one of the great things about Marx is he's a very complex writer, and so, so you're always finding new wrinkles in what he's doing. But the other thing is, of course, uh, the world is changing. When I was teaching Marx in 1970, Volume 1 of Capital was pretty hard to make relevant to daily life because you still had a welfare state around, a lot of state intervention, and Marx doesn't cover all of that. But, of course, since then, we've had a kind of, well, we've got to have more market, more market, more market. And by the time you get to the 1990s, actually, Marx's Capital, Volume 1, was beginning to tell a story which was right on your doorstep. And right now, it's right on the money in terms of explaining what in the hell is going on in the world. Right, so that's a retort that you often hear uh, critics of Marxism, they say, well, look, that was relevant to the 19th century. It's, they have a chronological understanding of relevance, right? But what you're saying is the complete opposite, that actually... Yeah, it's more relevant uh, because, because you, we're back in, 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 in the sort of story that Marx tells about what happens in competitive market economies. But it's also more relevant because when Marx was writing, capital was dominant only in a very small corner of the world, you know, sort of Britain, Western Europe, and maybe east of the coast of the United States, but the rest of the world was untouched by it except through merchant trading. Uh, now, of course, capital's everywhere established. I mean, it's, there it is in China, there it is in Russia, there it is in India, there it is in Indonesia. So in some ways, geographically, it's become far more widespread. So I think right now I'd argue that reading Marx is far, far more significant now than it was in, in, in 1857. Couldn't agree more, yeah. Um, we've seen a, a deluge of polls in the last couple of years, since really 2015 in particular, particularly in the UK, it's really interesting, but also in the US, where people say, and of course polling has its limits as a, as a means of data collection and analysis, but people are saying we don't really trust capitalism, we don't think it is going to lead to uh, improved standards of living. And actually there is some polling where people say they have more trust in socialism. There was a recent poll in the UK uh, in 2016, I think, where people said they had more faith in socialism than capitalism to deliver rising living standards. And this is particularly uh, evident amongst the young, both in the yeah. US and in the yeah. UK. Yeah. For you, what explains that? Firstly, the, 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 lo the losing of confidence in capitalism, but then uh, amongst the young, this turn to new ideas. Well, what Marx shows is that the closer you get to a free market capitalism and a competitive free market capitalism, the greater the level of inequality that will be experienced. And this was contrary to what Adam Smith suggested, because Adam Smith suggested that the more you organized a market society, the more that society would develop in a way that would be a benefit to all. But what Marx showed was, no, it's not going to benefit all, it's going to benefit the capitalist class, and, and it's going to make conditions worse for much of the working class. Now, we've had 30-odd, 40 years of people preaching us that only let the market do it work and everything's going to be fine, we're all going to be better off, yeah. and it's going to be more efficient and all the rest of it. So we've had that being preached to us again and again and again. And in the early years, you know, as the welfare state was dismantled and other things were dismantled, people still were waiting for it to deliver the goods. And then I think by the time you get to around 2000, it became clear it wasn't going to deliver the goods. And in fact, when people looked around, they kind of said, some people have become filthy rich on this system, and we've got nothing, uh, you know. And so I think from about then on, you start to see people realizing that this is a story they've been told, which is advantageous to the ultra-rich and the big corporations, mm -hmm. and they're not going to believe that story anymore. And then they kind of look around and say, well, there's another story. Well, there are various stories. Some people went off you know, into religious uh, forms. Some people took uh, themselves off and said, we're going to live in communes or something of that kind. Um, but then, uh, of course, somebody who has a theory of kind of says why this happens, it ha which happens to be Marx, mm -hmm. Suddenly, people kind of say, oh, yeah, there's a theory there. It explains why this all happened to us. And so, you know, I could write a book on the brief history of neoliberalism and say, this is what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And then people read it and they recognize it. Mm -hmm. You know, they really recognize it and they kind of go, oh, yeah, okay. Well, in that case, there's a problem with capitalism. We should do something about capitalism. And then the question of what to do about capitalism starts to come on the agenda. I mean, the alt-right in the US, the far right, they call, uh, when somebody 
uh, digests and then believes ideas of ethno-nationalism, um, you know, racist ideas fundamentally. They call it red pilling yeah. because they have this new ideological explanation for what are observable things in the world. Yeah. And for me, like, I wouldn't, <laughs> they call it red pilling, it's a stupid term, but for me, when you read chapters one and two of Capital, all of a sudden you go, my goodness, I know how this, well not how, but why this was produced, yes. uh, your glasses, these trainers, that camera, and how they all have a, a relationship, not just to one another, but also to us as consumers and producers. So, yeah, and that's what I always say to people is, look, if you don't ever want to read Karl Marx, because I made the mistakes that all undergraduates do. I read the 1844 manuscripts and the manifesto, um, uh, bits and bobs. But of course, capital is so long and so daunting that you don't want to do it. And as soon as I read the first two uh, chapters, I thought, God, I wish I'd come to it sooner. And I think you're partly responsible for that. But um, building on that, um, if you look at the movements beneath Bernie Sanders, beneath Jeremy Corbyn in the Anglophone world, they seem to me more Marxist in orientation, the base. I'm not talking about necessarily the politicians themselves, but the base, especially again amongst the young, and this is reflective of the polling. Uh, they seem more Marxist than social democratic. That is to say, they understand that there are structural limits to right. the, the economic system we have. Do you think that that is in, in part a, a result of not just your work, but I would say EndNotes uh, in the US, a journal, I'd say Paul Mason, a couple of quite influential public intellectuals who in the Anglophone world have made this, just in the space of five to ten years, a really, a, a relatively common analysis of, yeah, of the I, world. I actually would, would downplay the role of, you know, intellectuals and academics uh, in this whole thing. I think it, there's a sense that comes from the base. And if the sense is coming from the base, then people like myself, uh, are, we're obliged to try to articulate what that's about and why it's about what it is. And I think right now what you've got is you've got populations who are deeply alienated. Mm -hmm. Now, alienation is a good Marxist term. It talks about the way in which workers are alienated from their labor. It talks about how we're alienated from nature. It talks about how we're alienated from the conditions of daily life. We're alienated from political process, which says it's supposed to be democratic, but we know damn well we don't have anything to say about anything. So there's a tremendous alienation in society right now. So and I think that tremendous alienation creates a mass of population that is seething with anger and seething with the requirement that somebody say something about address this question of alienation. And it's at that point that, that somebody like myself can come in and say, well, look, I think there's a reason to try to explain this alienation. I'm not the only one who can say these things because, and there are many other sources of alienation because there are forms of racial domination and gender domination. There are issues of that kind as well. So, you know, it's at that point where, where it seems to me that the academic can step in and do something. I don't think we lead. I think we follow. Mm. And, and I think uh, why my interpretation of Marx, I think, is, is, is possibly being more influential now in academic circles is because I've always been interested in urbanization and I've always been questioned about urban daily life and uneven geographical development. In other words, I'm interested in what's going on on the ground. And my Marx is the, the Marx who helps me explain what's going on on the ground. Whereas a lot of Marxists are interested in the theory as theory, work with the theory as theory, and have a hard time relating it to, to the ground. Whereas I think what I have to say uh, is integrated very much with, uh, with an understanding of daily life, particularly uh, in cities. And I think it's interesting that a lot of the social movements that have occurred over the last uh, 15, 20 years have been urban social movements. The uprising in Gezi Park, uh, even the Occupy movement, uh, uh, the sort of revolutionary movements that occurred in Brazilian cities in 2013. So there's a lot of things going on at that level which are not normally approached with so through the Marxist lens, but my Marxism connects to that to that world and what's happening. And I think because of that connection, I, I, I think it is saying something about conditions of life for the mass of the population and, and people then pick up on it. But there's a quote from um, Milton Friedman in the introduction to capitalism and freedom. Uh, and he talks about the role of intellectuals and he says it's to keep ideas alive uh, at the moment in which they have very little popular resonance whatsoever. And clearly in that regard, 
you've played a very important role, haven't yeah. you? Oh yeah, keeping it alive has been, um, been was 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 pretty hard in the early 1990s, for example. Uh, everybody said Marxism is dead, and I have to keep on saying I'm not dead yet. You know, sort of <laughs> that's the kind of way in which uh, yeah, it, it 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 keeping keeping things alive is is actually a very a, a one very important role I think that we do play. Okay, so for the rest of the interview, we'll be talking about a lot of the things that Mark got right or we think he got right. Yeah. What did he get wrong? Oh, well, I wouldn't say he's got things wrong so much as he, he left so much unfinished. It's annoying, it's intensely annoying because he gets halfway into something and he leaves it aside. He also made a lot of assumptions about in his studies and, and, and he assumed away certain kind of questions. For example, he's fully aware that uh, our alienated relation to nature is, is problematic under capitalism and that capitalism is very destructive uh, towards our you know, natural environment and he, he understands those things. But the amount of time he spent talking about this was kind of minuscule. And, and, and I think that he says basically, oh, it's critically important. We know that capital survives by destroying its sources of wealth and the environment. But then, then he leaves it at that. So there was, there's an incompleteness in his work. And I, 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 and I, I think that that's one of the things that, that those of us who work in that tradition have an obligation to try to complete uh, what, he's, what he's saying. And, and of course, there is some very good work now on, on Marx and the environmental uh, questions. And the same would apply to things like uh, the domestic sphere, what goes on in the domestic sphere, household labor, those sorts of things. Marx says basically, well, I'm not going to deal with that because capital doesn't care a hoot about it. Uh, capital actually merrily goes on and just gives the workers their wage and says, you get on and figure out how to reproduce yourself with the wage. Mm -hmm. So Marx is reflecting back to us some of the practices that exist under capitalist society. So there's some good reasons why he makes these sorts of assumptions mm -hmm. he does. Mm -hmm. But, but it leaves things, a lot of things empty. So he doesn't talk enough about uh, you know, domestic issues. He doesn't talk enough about uh, gender questions. And you know, there is a kind of critique of Marx about that. And, and it's correct in a way, which is that he did not take his analysis into those, those sorts of terrains that he should have taken them into. But the way you phrase um, capital it's a critique of political economy, yes. it's a critique of the ideas of Malthus, Ricardo, right. yes. Smith. Um, I think that's a, that's a good explanation as to why. But very, very briefly for those watching, what is the relationship between uh, a circuit of valorization, workers selling their labor to a capitalist who makes commodities to make a profit? What's the relationship between that process and household labor, as you call it? Uh, well, you know, the worker is, in the first instance, uh, needs to be healthy enough to be able to participate in the labor process, and there needs to be enough of them. So the reproduction of a working class uh, and that class having a commodity, labor power, which is available to the capitalist at a reasonable price and is in surplus so that uh, the price can be kept way, way down, that is a very important aspect of the dynamics of this a social system we call capitalism. The other thing about the worker, of course, is that they're also consumers. Uh, so Marx talks rather reluctantly, actually, at a certain point in Capital, about the way in which workers are forced into becoming what he calls uh, 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 consumers uh, who, who are going to, going to satisfy the requirement of the market for the capitalist. Mm -hmm. So there is, among the working class also, a process which Marx does not get into in great detail, but mentions uh, enough to say that he thought it was important, which is the production of wants, needs, and desires in a population. So the, what goes on uh, in social reproduction is both the articulation of wants, needs, and desires uh, through daily life, and also the, the, the reproduction of the laborer as, as uh, somebody who is the bearer of labor power as a commodity, and, and, and th therefore the positionality uh, is of, of what goes on in the reproduction process is, uh, is, is a very important thing. Some of it gets commodified too. I mean, how, how, how much of the working class these days, you, you know, in, instead of cooking for themselves as they did maybe a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. go to McDonald's or, 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 or 
Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, I mean, and, and the kids do the same. So, so there's a lot of commodification of, of what used to be inside of the household also going on. So that segment of the, of, 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 uh, of the circulation process, which is, which connects, as it were, the circulation of capital, which is doing one set of mm -hmm. things, connects it to this reproduction process of the working class. And it's a complicated kind of, kind of relation, but it's a very interesting one to look at historically. You've got a gift, I think, for talking about these concepts in quite, um, you know, you use quite evocative imagery. And in this book, you talk about the hydrological cycle. Yeah, right. I think it's a very effective one. And that, that is similar. I, I think it was in the lectures and you talk about precisely this, the relationship between reproductive, social reproduction, household work, which makes possible wage labor. And it's almost like one cog, yeah. which allows another cog to spin. Uh, and that stuff comes out of Rosa Luxemburg effectively, doesn't it? Well, there's some of it comes out, but, but actually Marx has it. I mean, uh, for, just take, for example, the production of wants, needs and desires. I mean, in, in, in Volume 1 of Capital, Marx sort of, uh, in, particularly in the third chapter, he starts, he says, well, commodities are in love with money, but, you know, being Shakespeare, and he says, but the course of true love never did run smooth. And so he then gets into this whole debate about how new wants, needs and desires get created. And he deals with that in the economic and philosophic manuscripts. He deals with it in the Grundrisse as well. And when you think about it, you say, the state of our wants, needs, and desires, if we think of it as a historical product, where did it come from? Did it come from, you know, one day we sat down and we dreamed and we said, oh, I think I'd like a lawnmower, you know? And, and you kind of go, what for? What for? Well, uh, because they've built suburban housing and, and, and I'm expected to mow my lawn every <laughs> Sunday, you know? So, so the creation of wants, needs, and desires uh, through the history of capital has had an incredible impact upon the whole, how the whole world is organized and, and how we live our daily lives. And, and capital, of course, is, is, is expert at organizing society in such a way that, that you know, we suddenly find ourselves absolutely, it's absolutely necessary I have a cell phone. You know, absolutely necessary. It becomes a necessity in five, ten years. There was a time when we lived without cell phones. <laughs> and now, you know, it's very difficult to live without them. So you create a, a world. And of course, then what happens is you get new models of cell phones. So actually consumerism is being picked up and, 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 and transformed very fast. So everything becomes ob obsolete or, almost before you've got it. Uh, and, and the same is true with computers. I mean, I have an old computer on my desk, which is from about 20 years ago. And people look at it and say, that's a... That's an antique. Well, this is an interesting definition of an antique. And if you don't get a new computer about once every two years, mm. you know, you're kind of obviously not. So this is the world we've created. Mm. And it's about speeding things up, accelerating things. But that is essential for the dynamics of capital accumulation. So yeah, very briefly, um, somebody who may be attracted to right-wing ideas or even sort of moderate social democratic ideas, that acceleration and the ideas of built-in obsolescence yeah. are fundamental to capitalism because it constantly has to expand yes, yes. Uh, value in motion, right. what you yeah, call value yeah, in motion. Yeah. And it actually spills over all over the case. I mean, I live in an academic world where, you know, when I actually first got into it, and you know I've been in it a long time, if you did, you know, maybe two books in a lifetime, you were considered being a bit pushy. Now, if you don't publish a book every year, you know, and you, know, and you have publishers breathing down your neck and saying, where's the next book? <laughs> and if you don't publish a book every other year, people think you died, you know, and, 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 and so there's a tremendous pressure uh, to, 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 to sort of accelerate everything. And, and the result is life is very tense and alienation comes in a lot too, because we don't get time to enjoy ourselves. I mean, the, 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 the studies of, of uh, pre-capitalist societies show that in some of those societies, the working day was four hours. Can you imagine a world in which you only had to work for four hours? And then the rest of the time, you know, people would sit around and talk and, you know, whatever they wanted and, you know, why, why don't we have all, more free time? We don't have free time. We have all of this labor-saving equipment and, uh, you know, and, and less and less free time. I believe um, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, women in medieval Britain may actually have been taller. They have a few uh, bodies that sort of point towards this. 
than women around the time of the Industrial Revolution because yeah. they had less yeah. nutrition. And right. at the same time as having more nutrition, which obviously means more calories, despite greater agricultural productivity hundreds of years later, they also had, I think, 150 holidays or something. Yeah, I mean, right. you'll know this stuff oh, more than yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. This is uh, this obviously, like you say, has an impact on psychology. And the World Health Organization is predicting that by 2030, depression will be the number one. Um, I can't remember the precise wording, but the number one health issue yeah. globally, not just in Britain or North America, but right. globally. Right. Do you think there's a relationship then between this acceleration in daily life, uh, the, the the constant uh, increase of value and motion, and fundamental changes to the human psyche, which are Profound, right? I think, I, I mean, there has to be a relation. I mean, we, we just can't sit and be unchanged by uh, the speed with which things are going on around us and the transformations that are going on around us. I mean, and even, uh, you know, we, we live in this crazy world uh, in the United States now with uh, the president tweeting some crazy thing. And on Thursday, we're fearing there's going to be a nuclear exchange with North Korea and there's going to be a nuclear apocalypse. Uh, three days later, we've forgotten it because we're in some fo some silly little tweet about, you know, him hitting Hillary Clinton with a golf ball, you know. I mean, so, so, so these, the, the, the insanity, I mean, the, the insanity of a lot of this is, is, is I think, uh, real, real pressing right now. And I think that every mode of production creates a personality to go with it. I mean, you know, the Italian communist Gramsci talked about uh, American and Fordism, and he talked about the typical Fordist worker who's a different kind of human being from the uh, artisanal, artisan laborer. And of course, now we're down to, you know, the flexible specialization and precarious labor, and we have a different personality that goes with it. And everything is temporary, and everything's ephemeral, and everything is moving very, very fast. And it creates psychological stresses, and it creates alienations. And I think that society right now needs to sort of step back and think about, well, is this the right way to go? Is this, this the kind of people we want to be? And there is a debate going on about that. It's very interesting being in the United States. I mean, some of it's very moralizing. People kind of say, well, if the persona of the future is Donald Trump, do we really want to be like that? Is that the kind of human being we want to be? And a lot of people are saying, no, it's not. This is not, what, this is not who we are as Americans. I mean, there's a, there's a little phrase coming up again and again and again, and some of it is all sort of hot air and moralizing, but I think there's a real profound sense that our species being is being transformed into something which is rather ugly. And the authoritarian personality is coming out and we're seeing kind of the neo-fascist stuff come up and, you know. So I think there's a, there's a whole, and, and it's all connected. And this is the, the, one of the things I think that uh, we academics can try and do is to sort of pinpoint some of these connections and say that, yeah, there's depression, there's alienation, but look at the context in which this is occurring. Maybe we should change that context and that would relieve some of the pressure which is on you psychologically. So I want to return to the issue of attention, the new economy, psychology in a second. But uh, let's talk about debt. And this is something that you talk about extensively in the new book. Uh, it's beyond dispute that we have record levels of household debt, financial sector debt, banks and so on, and sovereign debt with nations. Why is that? Why is everybody in more debt, more or less, than ever before? I think it has to do with uh, the need to keep the system expanding. Capital is about growth. It has to grow at 3% a year, and that's a compound rate of growth, which means that it's actually going to accelerate over time and become faster and faster. It's got to do that, and the only way it can do that is by actually uh, discounting the future into the present. And the way you do that is you issue debt. And debt is a claim on future labor. So what it is, is if you're in debt to me, then you've got to work it off. And, and, and so what we're doing to students and others, putting them in debt is putting them in situations where they have to work it off. And that means the freedom of choice disappears. And this is what I call anti-value, being mobilized by capital to make sure that value gets produced. So corporations are in debt they've got to get paid off and so they've got to you know, they've got to go into into production or they've got to go into activity somehow or other to find enough money to pay off their debt so so the the acceleration of debt 
has a lot to do with the, the fact that the only way in which capital can satisfy its requirement of a 3% growth rate forever is by increasing the money supply and increasing the money that's available. And one of the ways in which you do that is to issue more debt. And in effect, we've got into what's called a kind of Ponzi economy where we borrow a lot of money this year to pay off our last year's debt. And then we pay even more money next year to pay off this year's debt. So the, 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 the sort of the, the piling up of debt right now. Um, and I think it's very interesting that uh, Mexico, when it got into debt in 1982, I, I think it got into a debt with about 80 or 90 percent of the debt was 80 or 90 percent of GDP, and this was considered catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Now the whole world is uh, in debt to the tune of something like 225 or 240 percent of the world's GDP. And nobody does anything. Everybody kind of says, well, this is normal. Well, ge even Germany, right, has, you know, allegedly yeah. frugal Germany has 70, 80 percent GDP. Yeah, debt right. Yeah. That, most people say that's 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 perfectly good. That's fine. Yeah. That's all. That's that's absolutely wonderful. But what's going on, for instance, in China is, is amazing. The amount of debt in China has accelerated hugely and it's now up to around 250 percent of GDP in, in China. The only thing about the Chinese is that they're in debt in their own money, which means they can just print more of their own money if they want to, you know, so they're not going to get caught out like Greece got caught out. Mm. So, so this is a, uh, this is a, uh, this is, I think, a, a, a very important point to make about contemporary capitalism, that what is the driving force of contemporary capitalism is no longer the greed of the individual entrepreneur or the, the desire to make a buck. I mean, yeah, it's, that's still there. And it's no longer the state sort of uh, organizing welfare and organizing the commanding heights of the economy as they did in social democracy with nationalized industries in the 1960s. It's no longer that. The big thing since the 1970s has been, has been the creation of this debt economy, which locks people in to a future. So, you know, we're looking at a future where everything is pretty much foreclosed mm -hmm. around the fact that we're going into a world of debt peonage. You, I, and everybody else, it's yeah. debt peonage. This was a subjectivity that had to be really assiduously sort of cultivated from the 1950s, yeah. 1960s. Yeah. People didn't want to get into debt. Right. Um, and there's often a moral critique of that, you know, from the right. Yeah. They would say, you say, well, if you can't afford it, don't take out the debts. But what you're saying is, well, actually, the fact that everybody's in debt is fundamental to the continued growth under, under capitalism, the and, necessary growth. And, and, and of course, it, it becomes a mechanism of survival. I mean, we, there's often this phrase about, you know, too, too, uh, too big to fail. Well, uh, you know, I even had a friend once who, who kind of said his, his plan was to get up so much debt that the banks couldn't possibly bankrupt him. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> and it was a phenomenal kind of thing. I mean, he just borrowed millions and millions and millions. And, 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 then, and then things were going bad and the banks were kind of going, well, we can't. <laughs> We've got to, we've got to keep him going somehow. There's a line on that, isn't there? So if you owe a hundred pounds to the bank, that's your problem. If you owe them a million, that's their yeah, problem. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so people, people, uh, the psychology of this is very different. I mean, I grew up in a world where being indebted was a bad thing. Yeah. I didn't even want to be indebted to buy a house uh, when I first got into, it. and finally I got indebted. Uh, you know, rather late in life because everything pointed in that way. And by the way. I was being told I was being financially irrational by not going into debt. And, and, and I kind of said, well, I like not being in debt, but, but you know, so these things take over. And we now live in a society where you know, almost everybody in the younger generation is used to running up debt on their credit cards, running up debt uh, to buy an automobile, running up debt to buy housing, running up debt with uh, department stores and getting different credit cards and using one credit card to pay off another credit card. And so the debt economy is kind of becoming uh, incredibly uh, sophisticated and it is a future foreclosed. And you talk about um capitalism needing growth of 3% a year. Yeah. I mean, anything less than 3% at the global level is defined as a recession, isn't it? Yeah, it's, so well... You've not, pluck, it, you've not just plucked it, that number out of thin air. No, no, 3% is generally, you know, people kind of, it seems to be the financial press is sort of, all right, if it's 3%, it's okay. If it's 2%, things are getting pretty sluggish, you know. If it's only 1.5%, we're in trouble. If it's 0%, we're in a crisis. Mm. So that's the, 
That's the sort of story. And what's the relationship between increasingly indebted economies and automation? Well, many workers lost their jobs in manufacturing because of automation and they were thrown out of uh, the labor force and they had good paying jobs. They now come out and instead of being steel workers with a unionized job, they're now, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, in a security guard or something like that, earning not very much. And, and uh, yet they've got to consume. How are they going to consume? Well, the answer was give them you know, credit cards. So what we, say, what we see is that the share of wages in national income has gone down almost everywhere from the 1970s onwards. It's a slippery slope, just goes down like this in nearly all the data. At the same time as the consumerism amongst the workers goes up because they're more and more using well, the credit card. And so they managed to maintain their standard of living uh, by, you know, going, going in credit and buying, you know, and, and at some point or other they start playing games as they did in the housing market in the United States and then they get caught and then they go bankrupt and, you know, the story is, you know, pretty, pretty savage. So I, I think that, that, that the, the, the debt economy became one of the ways in which austerity politics which would make the market less and less vibrant, gets, con gets countered by the debt, which actually makes the market much more you know, viable for um, systematic uh, capitalist consumption. I mean, in, in, in reality, we've been having declining living standards since arguably 2000. But that's been mitigated to a significant extent, hasn't it, by things like equity withdrawal from housing, uh, greater indebtedness, but also the fact that the global labour market after 1990, it doubles. So you can give your workers pretty low wage increases, but because consumer durables are so cheap, life still feels pretty good for them, doesn't it? Yeah. But we're, we're coming to the end of that now, aren't we? That, that, that episode almost of capitalism from, let's say, 1991 to 2008, it doesn't feel like there's another moment like that. We can't double the global labour market. I don't know. One of the things I'm very careful about is yes. giving very sure predictions mm -hmm. about what happens in, in uh, you know, to, to capitalist. It's a very wily beast, of course. you know, it, it, it shifts. And, and I don't know what, I mean, actually, to me, one of the big mysterious things right now is what's happening in China mm -hmm. and how the Chinese are handling this, because China's economy is now the biggest in the world and by some measures uh, and if not the the biggest uh, second biggest in the world and what happens in china is i think going to be crucial to global capitalism over the next 20 years and it's pretty hard to be you know very certain about exactly what happens in china most people have been betting on the idea there's going to be a financial crisis an over production crisis in, in China, but they've been saying that for about the last seven or eight mm. years. What you see is, a, a, is six months where it seems to go down and everybody says, here it is, and then the Communist Party steps in and back it comes again. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen uh, on, on, on that front. Mm. In the long run, yeah, you're right. I mean, I thought just personally that the housing market in the United States was going to crash in 2003. I thought it was. And I was saying it's going to crash. And then it got to 2004. I said the housing market's going to crash. Mm -hmm. And then it got to 2005. And I said the housing market's going to crash. And then I said 2006, the housing market's going to crash. So actually in 2006, I bought a place. And the housing market crashed. <laughs> where, did, where did you buy? <laughs> in Manhattan. OK, but that's, you weren't in Nevada or somewhere. No, 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 no. <laughs> California. No, 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 no. But the point was that, that I, was, I, I wasn't buying because I was convinced the housing market was going to crash in 2003. And right. then I got to the point where, so don't rely on me for any good predictions. My, my predictions are always disastrous. I never get the exchange rate right. I mean, if I, if I go someplace and I expect to get favorable exchange rate, I always find I get there and the, almost the day I get there, the exchange rate goes the opposite direction. So. Sticking with China, um, you detail some really incredible data around consumption of uh, concrete yeah. um, and an array of things. And you say more or less that had China responded to the crisis of 2007-8 in a different way, uh, yes, we've seen obviously stagnation in, in the UK in particular, the Eurozone, but more or less we would have seen a global downturn of a very different kind 
to what yeah. we have seen. Yeah. Uh, can you just speak about that briefly, the role of China in keeping global capitalism more or less on an even keel for the last decade? Well, China has a, a sort of insulated economy and, and, and in some ways. I mean, obviously has powerful relationships with the rest of the world. But it was faced with a crisis in 2007, 2008 because of the collapse of the U.S. consumer market. So all of the export industries just crashed. Mm -hmm. And now China is very nervous about having widespread unemployment. So what in effect they did was to say, we've got to employ all these people. How are we going to do it? So they launched this huge program of uh, infrastructure investment, uh, urbanization, uh, and, and uh, you know, all, all sorts of large, huge kind of, kind of projects. Uh, for example, in 2008, the Chinese had zero miles of high-speed train network. Uh, now they have 15,000 miles. They created 15,000 miles of high-speed train network in, uh, in about 10 years. I mean, this is astonishing mm. kind, of, kind of stuff. And this, this is going on all over China. Now, when you do that, you need raw materials. You need steel. You need copper. You need the, so whoever was producing copper around the world, whoever was producing uh, iron ore around the world, came out of the recession of 2003 pretty, up, cause pretty well. So Australia, for example, is sending all of these raw materials and minerals and that to, to China. And so Australia didn't have much of a crash in 2008 because of that. Chile didn't. Most of Latin America didn't because they, they were also producing soybeans and they were producing iron ore and, they, and copper. And you know, so all of those countries which were producing raw materials for the China market did very well because the, China, the Chinese demand was sending prices up. Uh, these countries were doing pretty well. And that part of global capitalism sort of didn't suffer too much in 2000. Because that's what I mean, that's where the growth's been coming. I mean, the growth hasn't been coming from the Eurozone right, or the UK, right. to a lesser extent the US. This is where the big growth. Now, there was a sort of recession in 2015, 16, and this went down a bit. And it's kind of interesting. Those countries that were doing extremely well up until 2015, 16, uh, were uh, countries like Brazil, suddenly Brazil goes into a crash because the China trade is no longer as buoyant, commodity prices are going down, Chile has problems, Australia has some problems. So everything that's attached to the China thing is kind of you know, very much dependent upon the continuation of this Chinese boom. And as I've said, you go through these phases where the Chinese boom seems like it's ended and it's brought down, and there's an attempt to curb steel production, and then all of a sudden it goes up again. And so suddenly, you know, Brazil is back and feeling okay. And the, the, so, so what's going on in China is, I think, a very important aspect of what's going, going on in the global capitalist economy right now. And my own view is that they saved global capitalism from something that was even more disastrous than happened in the 1930s. Let's move to Britain for a second. Yeah. We uh, had a bit of news out over the summer that Productivity now, I don't know if you've seen this. I didn't see this until last week. Productivity is now lower than it was in 2007, which is to say that an hour of work in Britain today produces less output uh, than it did 10 years ago. Right. Now, that has no precedent, uh, nor does the fact that we've seen a huge decline in real pay in Britain. People in this country, often by the media, are told that the crisis is far worse in places like Italy Spain and France, but by these measures, that's just not true. Why has Britain got such specific problems in regards to productivity and wages? Um, I just want to add one thing to that: that actually, life expectancy in Britain has gone down too. You know, so all of these indicators suggest that the mass of the people in Britain are not doing very well at all. Part of the problem, of course, is that the city of London has been doing great. So the city of London is fine and the financial services and all of that. So, you, you you know, people talk about two Britons. Well, there is two Britons and that that group. Now, the financial services, productivity is very hard to, 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 to measure. A lot of it has, of course, to do with uh, speed. So that the speed of transactions on the stock exchange and so on are now down to milliseconds or milli, mini, I don't know even what they are, you know. So, so, but the other thing is that improvements in productivity these days are actually globally harder and harder to come by. Because productivity is usually about measuring things like how to, you know, building a house, building an automobile, this kind of thing. And the, 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 the technologies 
which were very, very vibrant from the 1980s onwards, have essentially run out of steam. And so there's a, a growing sense in the United States in particular, and I, this, this would be true of Britain as well, is that the productivity growth uh, machine is, is petering out and that we're in for a very low uh, productivity phase, not, not lower productivity necessarily, but not, no, no improvements in productivity. So building on that idea of technological change um, and uh, a moving down in productivity, something that's, that's different to before. A few years ago, it was quite trendy to talk about cognitive capitalism. And yeah. of course, the outputs of cognitive capitalism yeah. are quite difficult to measure often. Uh, and that there was a new, almost revolutionary subject. Antonio Negri talks about this. A lot of the Italian right. guys talk about this. The, cogn the cognitariat. Right. Is cognitive capitalism a new kind of capitalism, or is it just, this just a load of uh, nonsense? Does Marx explain uh, the contemporary composition or, of work and, and, and its relationship to technology? Well, I think that that, that knowledge is obviously uh, a very important uh, feature of any you know, capitalist production system. Um, and uh, the free gifts of human history and the creation of knowledge are, are crucial to the functioning of capital. So uh, w one would not say that uh, knowledge is irrelevant. Uh, but as far as Marx is concerned, it's a free good. I mean, we don't pay a royalty every time we appeal to you know, uh, Newton's theory of gravitation. Um, or something like that, or, or or other engineering findings. You know, I mean, this is this is all a free good. What Marx does say, however, is that when t when knowledge gets incorporated in the machine, uh, then the need for knowledge on the part of the worker disappears, so that in a sense the worker can become you know more or less a trained gorilla or a zombie or whatever you want, and so the conditions of labour are likely to to become less and less attractive. And beyond that, uh, the fewer laborers may be uh, employed in, in productive uh, activity. So Marx does say that, look, there's, a, there's an interesting problem here. But uh, you, when you start to look at uh, some of the countervailing forces in this, that the expansion of the labor force uh, in some areas which are low productivity, uh, has been very remarkable under capitalism, and but we just don't recognise them because they're not in factories. We can't go to a factory and say, "Ah, there's the working class." You mm -hmm. know, I sort of talk about. I stand on the corner of 86th Street and Second Avenue in New York, and what do I see? I see lots of restaurants around. Well, you know, making hamburgers. Why is that not value creating as opposed to making automobiles? Uh, but if you look at all the little, you know, the, the, the hamburger stores and little places making soups and coffee and all this kind of stuff, um, this is very productive activity. But it's a different kind of productive activity and it's labor intensive. And so we've got a lot of labor intensive activities going, you know, developing, which are very hard to turn into high productivity, you know, automated thing. Now, artificial intelligence maybe can come in. It may be that I'll go be able to go to one of these places and press a button and say I want a hamburger and some, you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll come out the other end. Who knows? Uh, there are those, those, those real, real possibilities. But I don't think that cognitive, you know, the cognitive side of things is in itself productive of value. I think that it's very important as uh, a condition for the production of value that we have knowledge available, but the incorporation of knowledge in the machine is itself a very specific aspect of the, the, what the cognitive capitalists should be talking about, which are not. I mean, after all, if knowledge in itself was value creating, you know, we'd all be sitting around just creating knowledge and any old kind of article about this and any old novel about that. And they say, hey, I've made value, you know. And then, of course, uh, at some point or other, somebody's going to say, well, what's the exchange value of it? And, they, and everybody kind of says, well, this is a load of crap you're writing. Nobody wants to read this. I mean, why? So it's not, so I think the cognitive capitalism stuff was kind of a bit of a flash in the pan that was connected very much to what was happening in Italy and the Italian economy, and of course it doesn't apply at all to what's happening in China and what's happening in Bangladesh and on, on all the rest of it. So it's, it's, you know, it seems to me a bit of an Italian fad 
if I dare call it that. But there's, there was also a, a more general tendency <laughs> uh, in 1992. The first sort of instance of the word post-capitalism or post-capitalist comes from Peter Drucker. Yeah. And he talks about post-capitalist organisations in 92. Um, you have ideas around endogenous growth theory around the same time. So these broadly say the, say the same thing, don't they? They say that now, in terms of capitalism, knowledge is now the primary driver yeah. of new value. Um, and this guy now is the head of the World Bank, I think, Roma, the guy who, you know, the mm -hmm. big endogenous growth mm -hmm. theory guy. And when we're in a world where genetically edited E. coli viruses might be able to switch off Alzheimer's, I mean, that is only, I mean, that's just a, that's pure information, isn't it? So, yeah. and that is clearly generative of value. It's yeah. not labor. It's not uh, resources. So what, what would you call, I mean, e, e. coli is a free gift of nature, but we're editing it to have very, very incredible consequences for human health. So how, how do Marxists understand that? Well, the, but the, the, you know, the remedy for E. coli is, is itself, once it's produced, it, 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 it's no longer, a, it should not be a commodity at all. Uh, it should be freely available to everybody who has a problem, and, and that's that. Now, how much value goes in, in terms of the research, this kind of stuff, mm that gets to the point where you've got the, you know, the, the genetic code that allows you to do certain, certain things. Yeah, that's all productive of value. But, but uh, once, it, once it's produced, then, then that, what, the reproduction costs of the vaccine or whatever it is that's gonna do this, the reproduction are, are close to zero. Mm. And it therefore should be a free good. I mean, that's how I would uh, understand it and one want to look at it, uh, not denying the fact that there is a, you know, a labor process going on in terms of uh, technology, uh, the technology. And actually, Marx does talk about this when he kind of says, you know, at a certain point, technology becomes a business. Yes. And when you, when you talk about technology as a business, you're no longer looking at a particular kind of uh, factory that needs a new technology. What you're looking at is somebody who comes up with a generic commod uh, technology, like the steam engine, which could be used all over the place for different reasons. And the same would be true of the computer, and the same would be true of uh, data analysis and, and all the other things that we're, we're seeing right now. So, so these, these uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, activities, I, I think, are, 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 are crucial. Uh, to the way in which life is lived, but they're no longer embedded, as it were, in, in, in the further circulation of, 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 of capital as value. They are, as I said, free goods, uh, which should be available to everybody. Speaking of fads uh, and data, uh, you'd often hear the, the refrain from the sort of financial classes that data is the new oil. Yeah. Data is a resource. Right, right. I mean, does that make any sense or...? Well, data is very useful. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against data. I think data is great, and no, no, lots of good analysis of data is fine. And I like the data that gets there that makes the traffic lights work better, so yeah. I can drive around London w w without too many traffic jams. Fine. I'm always really fine with that. I was going to ask you a question: Is it value or is it anti-value? And the people watching this will have to read your book to understand what we're talking about. Here. Uh, that uh, if that, it's data that's used in order to. Uh, allow predictive analysis of future behavior. Sure, that's anti-value, isn't it? No, data is just data, you know, I mean, and, and how you use it. I mean, it's a raw material of a certain kind. And right. So, so, so you simply amassed a mass of raw material. I mean, it's no different than, than laying out a lot of, uh, of coal on the, on the ground and then kind of saying, okay, the coal is there, now what are you going to do with it? And now the big question is, what do you do with the data? But the data, if it, if it say, is data that's gleaned or by Google or Facebook from your uh, mm -hmm. consumer habits, mm -hmm. that's a result of the application of human intelligence. Yeah. So that's yeah, not yeah. a natural resource, is it? Well, uh, human intelligence? In terms of you're on Facebook, it's a gift, you know, I say I like David Harvey, I like all human, his books. Human that intelligence is a gift of nature, is a gift of human nature. And, and, and right. that's Marx's point about, about the, the intelligence inside of, the, of our heads is, is something that comes uh, from uh, our human nature. I mean, he says about, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, he, he, talk, he talks about uh, the, the way in which works of art are, are he says, uh, just works of art are, are um, done out of human nature. 
uh, that they uh, that they are uh, like a, like a silkworm makes silk. They do it of their own nature. That human beings invent things of their own nature, and that therefore this is not value production. This is this is just people being active, doing things, and all the rest of it. It's not it's not it's not value producing. It becomes value producing when it becomes integrated into the commodity production system. Which it is if you're on well, Facebook or Google, right? Well, it gets involved, and in well, there is an extraction of rent which goes on here, which is which is a rent on on what you have done, the knowledge of what you have right. done. That's the big data which 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 comes on. But my main objection to this is, you know, w w let's think of all the things that you can't get data on. And the trouble with the big data stuff is it assumes that if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. All right, what about alienation? What about you know all of those things? How do you measure alienation? How do you, and actually, isn't alienation one of the key features of our contemporary economy? Give me the big data set that tells us all about alienation. Maybe well, they could, right? I mean, maybe well, they could put like, you know, they, wearables they, on they, synapses they and they could know find, how much they neurotransmitters could, yeah, and well, dopamine could, and serotonin we're producing. Well, they could. He's they, alienated. He's depressed, you know? Yeah, right. No, they could, they could, they could probably do uh, all that sort of <laughs> stuff, but alienation. Yeah. And in terms of what people do with it is yeah. not uh, easily, and, and, and actually what's going on with Google and all the rest of it yeah. is, is, again, the, the, the kind of creation of scenarios of, of, of alienated labor and alienating labor. And, and, and the interesting thing here is a lot of the production these days is being shifted to the consumer. So we become what uh, Toffler long ago called prosumers. That is, uh, we go to the airport and we check ourselves in. Mm. Uh, we go to the supermarket, we check ourselves out. Mm. Uh, we actually have to do a lot of the work. Uh, and increasingly what capital is doing is kind of acting more and more as a rentier and saying, all right, we've got this situation, we've got this systems all set up. Now you, you check yourself in and do the work and, and, and then we'll extract the rents. I mean, this is, this is the, the yeah, capital is changing and it's getting more sophisticated about these things. And you, and you can see how gains in productivity on this are not necessarily gains in productivity of physical output. They're gains in productivity in the sense of actually extracting surplus value from the whole of the population uh, by rentier activities. And in many ways, capitalism is becoming much more about a rentier society. A great example of the, the prosumption economy is um, solar. Yeah. And solar energy and sort of uh, the seers of modern capitalism, so somebody like a Jeremy Rifkin, will say this is phenomenal, we'll have distributed energy, everybody will be able to produce their own energy. What you're saying is, of course they'll be able to generate their energy, they'll have to maintain their local energy infrastructure, but this will still mean, in fact, a greater amount of value is extracted and going right. towards right. 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 rent seekers in this right. case. Right, right. So um, we've talked about attention, we've talked about data, I want to stick with the idea of uh, the attention. We, before we start, you said, you know, what's the attention economy? I've just made it up, really. Yeah. I've made it up. It's a concept in uh, Tiziana Terranova, an Italian sort of Marxist feminist, talks about it. The attention economy is interesting for me because in your book here, you outline three moments in which uh, capital as value in motion is, is, is doing its thing. In valorization, either production of value, people can understand that, people, people in factories very right, easily right, right. You know, uh, imagined, in circulation, and then in realization at the point of consumption. And it seems to me that with the attention economy, there's a contradiction between the valorization of capital and the realization of capital, mm -hmm. which is to say, um, Cal Newport talks about this in the book on deep work. And he says, I don't, go, I don't have a Facebook account, I don't use my phone, and I'm incredibly productive because I'm not constantly being seduced by all these you know, little dopamine hits of notifications or buy this or look at this or today's story right. about Donald Trump right. being right. an idiot. And it seems to me there is this profound contradiction between competing elements of the capitalist class where Facebook want one thing, i.e. your attention, but then simultaneously that uh, undermines your ability to do productive work at the point of valorization. Uh, I'm interested to know what your take is on this because it seems to me quite remarkable that even today, the most important piece of fixed capital are these, right? Yeah. And I've, I've got a PhD, I've been in education for 25 years, and yet capitalism has given me one of these things which makes me bloody useless, and it completely undermines all of that work. So what's your explanation for that? Because, I mean, it, for me, if you're thinking about capitalism as a system which is trying to create more value, generate greater uh, 
outputs, it, it seems a contradiction which I can't quite grasp. Well, I, I, I guess I, uh, almost, there's almost a classic way to look at this from Marx's perspective, which is that you know, on the one hand, uh, capital should be producing more and more value because it needs to do that in order to, to, to guarantee its future expansion. The measure of value is money. Can you expand the money without expanding the value? Does money betray value? And I think the case, there's a strong case right now to say that, that, that money is betraying value. And it's interesting that uh, I was reading some you know, China stuff the other day, and the Chinese understand it this way, that uh, on August the 15th, 1971, uh, Richard Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. After that, there was no discipline behind global finance. And then the question arises, well, what's world money when we've lost gold? The US managed to get that, and here I put in my, some of my own stuff, that it managed to make sure that the dollar became the, the, the standard for the world. And it did it in a couple of ways. One was it went to Saudi Arabia that had all this the, the, the surplus oil and, and had a lot of money uh, sloshing around and said, basically, you've got to recycle that money inside of the United States. And so all of the oil money came back to the investment bankers in, uh, in New York City and the investment bankers got to play with it. The second thing was, they said to the Saudis, you only write the oil contracts in dollars, not in any other currency. And that meant that the the petrodollar, as it were, became the global currency at the time. And then people could start playing with it. And currencies were moving around, and then people could start to make money off, you know, the currency movements. The famous one was George Soros betting against uh, the British pound in the exchange rate mechanism in 1992. And he borrowed, you know, billions, and he bought Deutschmarks. And then the pound gets devalued, and he then converts the Deutschmarks back into pounds. And of course, he's... He's, he's made a, over a billion pounds in three days. Okay, well, this is, this is, this is a fantastic sort of way to make money. Where do I sign? And, and yeah, where, you know, <laughs> when you tell somebody this, everybody says, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> but then, the, the, you know, the Chinese looking at this kind of thing are saying, well, actually, right now, money is being made in the West, mainly through mechanisms of this kind. And this is what the main you know, players in the West are, are, are doing. They're not actually interested in making things anymore. They're interested in playing the financial markets and, and, and coming out that. And then, then, then the Chinese kind of say, look what happened in Southeast Asia. Uh, actually, what happened in Southeast Asia was uh, that uh, the credit system suddenly froze up and, and people couldn't, couldn't borrow anything. So liquidity was denied. Companies went bankrupt. Uh, all over the place, and the banks and the financial institutions from Japan and the United States and Europe went in and bought up all the companies at dirt prices. Then they release the liquidity. Then the economy re re recovers. Then you sell them back at a huge amount. And basically what the Chinese say was, you know, what the U.S. and, and everybody's been doing is actually robbing the rest of the world of value by these monetary gains by these mon playing these monetary things. And they couldn't do that if you had a stable currency behind it, which was, which was the gold. So off, being off the gold standard has been crucial to be able to rob the world of value. And this is the Chinese view. And then the Chinese kind of say, you know, look, what the, look what's happened. And it's not the country that does it. It's not the US that does it. It's the bankers who do it. it, it all of the benefits go, and I point about this in this, all the benefits go to a certain class. And that's how the rich have got incredibly richer in this point, is by raiding the world of value through these financial manipulations. And then the Chinese kind of say, look, uh, after East and Southeast Asia, they did Brazil, they did uh, Argentina, they did Russia, they, you know, and then of course they did Greece, when, you know, really, they, they, everybody's been doing this. And they said, you know, we're next. They're gonna raid us in China, but we're not gonna open our capital markets. 
So there's this incredible pressure on China to open its capital mm. markets and you know and stop manipulating the currency and all this kind of stuff. And the Chinese always say, "Yeah, we're trying to, you know, but you just can't seem to manage to do it." You see, <laughs> and, but you know what they're thinking is they're thinking is open our capital markets, we'll get raided. We're not going to do it because according to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, China is still technically not a free market. Right. Economy. Yes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Which is great when you get these people, these right wingers, and they go, "Oh, socialism doesn't work." Look. You need to have capitalism. Look what it's done yes. for the global south. You go, well, look, your organization, guys, WTO, doesn't call it a free market economy. No, so. no, right, right, right. So, yeah. so, so there. But, but again, you know, what, what's been happening since the 1970s has been the betrayal of value by these monetary operations. And, and the regard for value production has come less and less. And in that sense, some of the things that are said by the cognitive capitalists are right, you know, that that actually the value theory is in a lot of trouble because uh, it's not, you know, capitalists are not actually paying attention to, to doing the right kinds of things to, to create a stable capitalism, which creates, of course, the anticipation that we're in for a humongous kind of financial crash at some point or other down the line, whether it's located in China or somewhere else, who knows exactly. Mm. 1971, this adoption of the gold standard, prior to that for hundreds arguably thousands of years as a, as a metallic standard to metallic, yeah. the most powerful currencies. Yes. Um, that changes in 71. It's a huge experiment. We still don't really know the consequences of it. You talk about, sort of, towards the end of the book, about state finance nexus, which has existed since 1700s, the late 1600s, right, with the emergence right, of central banks. Right, right. What did that moment in 1971 mean for the state finance nexus? And... What comes after it? Are we, are, we, are, we, are we in the end days of that moment now? No, I think we're right in the middle of, uh, of it uh, still. And, and, and in effect, what happened after going off the gold standard, as you may remember, uh, there was uh, in, this, in, in the United States and in Britain, there was huge inflation. Uh, interest rates had to go up to around 18% or you know, 20%, I think, in a couple of cases. And the right blames trade unions for this. Because... Yeah, that's right. No, but this was, this was, this was because, uh, you know, the temptation to just get, print money and get out, get out of a crisis by printing money, and that's what, was, in effect, was happening. Uh, and then, of course, you get inflation uh, as a result. So the control of inflation then suddenly became absolutely critical, and that's when the banks and, and, and the, the central banks and the Treasury had to get together and have a coherent kind of policy, and a coherent policy that stretched to the international institutions, primarily the uh, International Monetary Fund, but also the Bank of International Settlements and the World Bank and places like that. So you got, you got the emergence of an apparatus which was trying to make sure that the global money supply did not go so far out of whack that you had the kind of inflation of you know, Weimar Germany in the 1930s worldwide. I mean, what a catastrophe that would be. And everybody realized that would be a catastrophe. So then uh, the, 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 the Treasury and, the, and, and uh, the Federal Reserve stepped in to solve or try to solve the Mexican crisis with a politics of austerity. Uh, they similarly stepped into uh, South Korea uh, much later and did the same thing. So, so this is the state finance nexus. And it was this wonderful moment in the uh, economic crisis of 2007-2008. After Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, nobody seemed to know what to do. The president sort of disappeared. Congress <laughs> just didn't know what to do. The Russian stock market shut down yeah, for like three days. Uh, right? Yeah, everything was going crazy. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, out on television came two people. One was Ben Bernanke, head of the Federal Reserve, and the other was Hank Paulson, mm -hmm. Secretary of the Treasury. And they came out with a three-page piece and said, this is what we've got to do. That was the state finance nexus. Yeah. Now the rest of government mattered. Congress didn't matter. The Supreme mm -hmm. Court didn't matter. Whether this was constitutional or not, nobody was going to ask any questions of that kind, even though it plainly was unconstitutional, some of the things they were demanding. They said, this is the only way that we can solve the situation, mm -hmm. solve it. Congress kind of didn't like it because it was only three pages. So mm -hmm. the Congress actually rewrote it so it was 330 pages uh, full of gobbledygook, you know, so, so they felt that they'd been done. But in effect, at that time, 
the people who ran the whole world economy. That was Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke who, you know, with the instruments there. And you saw they were in negotiation with the Bank of England, and you were also, they were also in relation with the Bank of Japan. So there was a coordination between the world's central banks. And shortly after that, there was a meeting of the G20. Mm -hmm. This was a state finance nexus kind of uh, saying, OK, we now need to get, you know, and it's, it's interesting, it used to be the G7, yeah. or G6, and then it became G7, then it became G8, then this was the G, G20. And that G20 meeting actually came to a formal agreement that they were going to stabilize the global economy together in a certain kind of way. The next G20 meeting, it all broke down. But at that moment, the, what saved global capitalism was, was this core power, which decided on the way out was to do uh, a whole set of things internationally, but also to do things domestically in terms of bailing out the failing banks. Speaking of the Italians, 1970s, Antonio Negri, some of the good stuff I think he wrote is around the time of the disruption of the gold standard. Yeah. And he says previously there was, a, there was a mode of governance in regard to the economy and it was linked to uh, a set of metaphysical presumptions really about the, the innate value of right. metal or uh, right, silver or right, gold. Right. And then that's replaced by pure political management Absolutely. of exchange value by yeah. central banks. And so while the neoliberals say, look, we've depoliticized finance, we've depoliticized central banks. In fact, they've never been more political. No, they're, 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 they're the heart of this whole thing. And, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to watch their uh, evolution. So final sort of part of the interview, I want to talk about uh, technology, history, and change. Um, you've talked about before uh, how the, the historical process moves through, according to Marx, in a footnote of capital, seven distinct moments. Yeah. Uh, they're distinct, but they, they're also in dynamic tension and they in, in, impact one another. Um, you write in this book that that's, the, that's what drives the historic process under capitalism. I'm not sure if you would say prior to that as well. I mean, it makes sense to me as a, as a, as a framework for prior to capitalism as well. And these seven moments include daily life, uh, mental conceptions, production processes, relationship to nature. I find it a really, really powerful way of understanding historic mm -hmm. change. What you say is technology is another one. And what you say is that perhaps one of the sort of the common mistakes of our contemporary moment is that activists, but also capitalists, people like Silicon Valley CEOs, privilege that technological change as almost like a magic bullet in terms yeah. of solving intractable yeah. problems. Yeah. Can you just sort of briefly talk about these seven moments and and your, your misgivings around technological determinism. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, clearly the, the, the dramatic transformations in technological mixes and so on are, are, are you know, are revolutionary in their implications. So I'm not going to downplay it and pretend it's uh, not, uh, not relevant. Uh, but there are then some people kind of say, well, uh, uh, there are institutionalists around who say, well, the real reason why things going is that different institutions get set up. Institutions of I mean, the favorite ones are private property and law and market and that therefore no amount of technology is going to actually give you development unless you have the right institutional framework. And only when you have the right institutional framework can you get a freely developing capitalist uh, kind of economy. So you get the institutionalists who kind of say, oh well forget all the other things, just, just, just let's do, you know, Let's do the institutional mm -hmm. side. Uh, then there are those who kind of uh, look at uh, the relation to nature and uh, can be geographically determinist, geographical in the sense of physical, geographical conditions. So that there are some people who even sort of would argue that China is a privileged in terms of its uh, geographical situation right now relative to the privilege that did it, it, uh, emerge in Western Europe because it was a fragmented kind of diverse e ecological niches and small kingdoms could uh, sort of be in contact with each other. So some people have a, a geographical determinist. You read Jared Diamond or somebody like that and this is, yeah, the geographical uh, de determinist kind of line. Um, and then you will get the, 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 the daily life 
kind of thing, that, or the mental conceptions, that uh, the idealists who kind of say, well, you know, the fact that people suddenly started to think capitalistically in the sort of late feudal period, and it came about sort of gradually, but then there was a revolution in mental conceptions, uh, and sometimes the mental conceptions uh, were about, uh, you know, personal gain, and I start the a uh, whole book, you remember, with this long quote from King John, mm. which is about uh, a moment in English history when the commodity is suddenly becoming the arbiter of uh, uh, political loyalty, uh, as opposed to sort of uh, loyalty to the house and kinship and, mm. and, and tribe and, and all the rest of it. So that this transformation uh, of, 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 of thinking, so that uh, I now monetize uh, everything I do and judge it in terms of its monetary worth. And even at that time, there the began to be this question of what is the value of a man, or was a man, but you could also put it in terms of a woman too, but it was, you know, the value of a man is, is given by their productivity and their capacities and things of this sort. So you, you, you find all of these elements uh, historically were there. And, and to me, uh, it's important to think about a revolutionary process that approaches all of these elements mm. uh, in some way or other. And one of the things I like about it is it says you can start a revolutionary moment anywhere. Mm. You can do it technologically, because there is a question, what is a good socialist technology? But then there's a question of what are the good socialist institutions? Then there's a question of what is a good socialist production mm. apparatus? Mm -hmm. And there's a question of what is a good socialist daily life? So all of those questions are embedded, and I think the failure of some communist uh, experiments, uh, Soviet Union and the like, was it failed to look at all of those elements and say, what is a good element of all of those, and how can they dynamically interact so that you don't end up with complete stasis in the system? Because the Stalinist view was, change the productive forces, mm -hmm. change the you know, technologies, everything else will fall into place. Well, plainly it didn't. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my view is that unless you change the social relations, you know, mm. fundamentally, and the mental conceptions that are attached to those social relations, and you know, at a certain point you're not going to get anywhere, no matter what kind of technology you have, which is why I'm very much against this post-capitalist story right now, which seems to me to be completely uh, erroneous. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. but. Um... This is also a mistake that's made by the left, as you've just said. So the sort of uh, the Soviet Union yes. privileged yes. aspects of this, and then you could say historically, well, eco-anarchists privilege relationship to nature. Anarchists yep. historically, I think, privilege social relations. You know, if you don't, if you're not yep. mean to people, then that's going to. It's a good thing. You know, right. communists shouldn't be mean to people, right. uh, or, or anti-capitalists shouldn't be mean to people. But it's clearly in, inadequate in changing the world. So a request, by the way, is can you write a book about this? For me, oh. because I, I <laughs> no, that's a that's a kind of that's the kind of thing uh, you know that uh... a short. I think a short book saying, look, you can only, look. Capitalism is revolutionary because it acts through the entirety of this constellation, and cl therefore clearly any anti-capitalist project has to do likewise. Right. Uh, and I think that's a really good lesson for anybody that wants to change the world. Yeah. Not that they have to focus on all seven, but that they can't ignore or or right. dismiss any right. other elements. No, no. Oh, I, I, I think, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll write, I'll write a short book on it. <laughs> you'll, you'll get it three weeks' time. <laughs> um, finally, um, there's, there's no mention of uh, socialism or communism in the book, certainly not communism. Right. Uh, now, clearly, I know that for many people that has negative connotations. Yeah. Uh, but Marx is quite clear. He, he puts communism in counterpoint to capitalism yeah. Yeah. and all the things we've discussed production for exchange, commodities, and so on, he says that this will no longer exist in communism. And he, in Capital 3, I think it is, he says that capitalism, as with all historic society, is a condition of necessity, a state of necessity, uh, and that communism is a state of freedom, which I read as essentially post-scarcity. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about the limits of capitalism you have in this book and your previous books for years now. And I know that there's a history of this on the left. Marx says, you know, my job isn't to write the recipes for the cookshops of the future. Uh, but are we not at a moment where that is, that is quite important now? I think, well, I think there, the way I would pro approach this is again, back, go back to sort of daily life considerations. 
and start to talk, talk about processes of uh, what I would call uh, revolutionary reforms, which is, uh, you know, the idea that uh, we can all storm some, I don't know, the Federal Reserve Bank and change the world, you know, I just don't <laughs> think that's feasible. And right now, the capitalist state apparatus has such powers of uh, domination and repression available to it, uh, militarization. Uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, some sort of street revolt is not going to make it, which is, uh, I think street demonstrations are going to be very helpful, but 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 uh, a kind of a, a storming, the winter, of, storming palace, the winter palace is not going to work. So I, I think about revolutionary reforms, and I think that you can uh, start with a simple kind of process and say, look, over the last 40 years, we've seen an increasing intensification of the commodification of education. We have to reverse that. We have to decommodify education for everyone. And that's a, that's a tangible kind of thing, and it's a feasible kind of thing, actually, when people could look at it. Mm. We have to do the same with healthcare. Uh, we have to do, try and do as much as we can on that uh, for housing, because housing is a right, and uh, right now it's, you know. So in other words, we want to maximize the delivery of use values on education, healthcare, housing, and it has to be outside of the commodity kind of uh, rationing. Mm. We should do the same with, with basic foodstuffs. A basic, a basic diet, package, food stuff should be free mm. for everybody. Mm. This would be great because actually the wastage in the food system right now is huge. 40% of the food in the United States goes to waste. It just, I mean, I always wonder, I watch you know, more early morning people going through and taking out the rotten apples and throwing them away. If, if you kind of said, all right, it was going to be a basic, basic uh, package, if you like, for everybody in the city, uh, you know, so much in the way of this or that, you know, and then you can calculate and cut down on waste and all kinds of things. Mm. And, and, and so, you know, and, and basic uh, foodstuffs could be taken care of and then people can go and buy other things. So, in other words, in other words it seems to me there are some, some very, very simple kind of proposals which you can put to a social movement and say, do you believe in these, these, uh, in these, in these proposals? Uh, if you do, then let's, let's, uh, let's push very hard mm -hmm. to reorganize things in such a way that we can deliver these kinds of goods in a, in a certain uh, kind of way, and we can deliver them uh, freely to the mass of the population. So we start to do things like that. So I... I, I... I obviously agree with that in its entirety. I mean, I self-identify as a class war social democrat pending post-scarcity communism. So right, I'm not going right. to dismiss the importance of those, those, um, those as things that should be pursued politically. But with one eye also to changes in technology, automation, yes. right. Um, right. Uh, the internet of things. This is where I think post-capitalism is useful, yeah. is that Marx obviously talks about socialism. He says socialism is still a condition of necessity. Communism isn't. Right. And I, I think what the post-capitalist people are trying to do is perhaps integrate elements of what you're saying around the, the radical social democratic revolutionary reform stuff with an eye also to what may be um, such a disruption in technology that it makes yeah. possible a different mode yeah. of production. Right. Do you, do you, would you say that makes sense? or uh, Only up to a certain point, because at a certain, certain point you've also got the class relation which needs to be dissolved. And when I'm talking about, you know, turning all of these things into rights and, you know, that, that, that I know perfectly well they're not going to be able to do that without, without actually confronting uh, the centers of economic and political power in the world right now, which go all the way from, and, we, and, and the interesting thing is we know who these people are, you know, we know the Murdochs and the, the <laughs> Uh, and even the, the supposedly good guys like the Gates and the, 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 the Warren Buffetts, you know, I mean, we know who they are. So we know who the capitalist class is, and they've got to be disempowered and, and completely disempowered. And there has to be a much more democrat democratic form of political organization, which I think is crucial right now. And I know that uh, the people are playing around with sort of assembly structures and things of that sort, and there are these experiments in Rojava with the Kurds and so on. Uh, and and uh, some of these I think are extremely interesting and we should be, you know, thinking about how to implement 
uh, strong processes of democratization, uh, which I would hope would cope to some degree with the levels of alienation that are currently felt in society. That is, people having the capacity to participate in their, you know, in the, in, in the decisions about their own futures. That to me is, is, a, is a very important aspect also of what a revolutionary transformation is about, but that's an institutional. That means switching to the institutional track, and then it has to. True, then you have to think about education, which is one of the reasons I think people should read Marx. Because you know, why wouldn't we read Marx these days? It's crazy. He has all these wonderful things to say and interesting things to say about what's going on in the world, and yet we live in an educational world where hardly anybody talks about him, and if they do, they get him all wrong. <laughs> Right. And uh, deliberately so in many instances, in some instances, because, you know, I just don't know how to read it right. That seems like a wonderful place to end. Yeah. You've been a gent as ever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Cheers. <laughs>